<laughs> so nice to see you, Hachi. Nice to see you, too. Yeah, I was just uh, actually uh, thinking about this a moment ago. Uh, have we actually ever met in person? I've never had the opportunity. No, it's it's really a special opportunity for me. So thank you so much. I, I was having dinner last night with a colleague, and uh, and I was thinking uh, about when I first got to know who you were, and I dawned upon me, you learn Hakutsu Kata from my student, Ron Beer, like three decades ago or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or late 80s, early 90s, somewhere around there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Just it's been it's so been you know in Chinese Kung Fu terms, we are brothers, you know, you are my <laughs> little brother, right? <laughs> That's true. That's true. Oh, That's my, so... oh, my, uh... <laughs> oh yeah, I really um, appreciate it. Uh, we are recording now, but I'll clip this intro and then uh, we'll do we'll do a uh Everybody knows <laughs> me and my antics anyway. Uh, but I am trying to, I'm just trying to, I'm kind of looking down, but you're up. So I want to be able to, I want to see if I can, I know I can switch these, uh, sure. the, I can't drag it, not drag it. There's a position, there's a something where I can change the uh, view. There is view, view speaker. Ah, yeah, that's a little bit better, but uh, hang on a second. Is there another one I can do too? Gallery, gallery, no. Uh, hide myself, yeah. <laughs> hide that. Uh, hide non speaker, speaker. Wow, well, okay. We'll I put it one. in gallery view on my own, that way we're side oh, by gallery, side. Yeah. So then, the when the uh recording is posted, it'll have both of us there. Hey, cool, you're in your dojo right now. Look at that, eh? I, I am, I am, yeah. Trident, Guando, another trident. Can't, yeah. Oh, it's a, 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 a flail. Uh, yeah, I've got like a, a maki, nag, the, nagamaki. Two yeah. section staff, a horse cutter. Two a flail, right? Yes. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, hook uh, spear. Spear, another, I can't see the spear. A hook spear, yeah. Bow, yeah. uh, some chiquana, yeah. two section staff. A sigh, all the Okinawan so, weapons. A bunch of sigh. Teach you, teach you in Chinese, right? Yeah. A new table. Uh, thank you, Tanya Shinken. Uh, yeah. And up above, we got uh, Amato Sensei, Amato Shinko. Yeah. Uh, who's yeah. beside him over there? Who's beside This Shinko? is Shinken Gima, who is much earlier in their family lineage, Shinken Gima. Gima Shinken. Gima Shinken. Not to be confused with the Gima Shinka who went to Tokyo uh, and assisted Funagoshi Gichin, right? I think. Think that he may be earlier. I'm not. I'm not certain. You. You would know much. Better on the other me. side, you've got Higa Seiko, Miyagi Chojin, and Higo Nakanjo. Yes. 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 Good. Yeah. Nice shots. And then yeah. uh, five ancestor boxing stuff over on this wall. Yeah. Oh, I can just see the five in Chinese. Yeah. Chinese. Yeah, yeah. 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 Nice. Nice. Uh, oh, yeah. you have that. You have a names up on a wall for your Japanese style as well. Yeah. So. The Nifurikake. I think that's a wonderful thing to make people feel welcome and feel a part of the dojo. So. Oh, sorry. And you got uh, uh, Okinawa Go Juju Karate Do. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's right. And I had forgotten that you were actually already a, a Goju stylist, right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Originally, that was the style that I started in. And it was a Japanese version of Goju, of course, uh, as that oh, was um, more, more prevalent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My, uh, I was in the Philippines. Uh, my grandfather was working there. I spent a few summers over there. And one of his employees was a student of... Uh, Tino Serbrano that I learned later, and then he had gone uh, with them to visit uh, Yamaguchi and family in in Japan, and it was teaching. Um, so he he taught me uh, Japanese goju, and then I came back to the states and was trying to find schools here. So yeah, that was the start of my you, journey. You were you were in Florida? Was it Florida? So I'm still here. Yes, yes, yep. Yeah, in Florida. Yeah, okay. yeah and, and Ron you, Ron, Ron Beer used to come down. Yeah, there was a school down here that I was training in. And I think Ron, just in his travels, was trying to visit a school and um, stopped by our school and did some workshops for us. And we just had a wonderful time. He taught us a bunch of, you know, the the, the Hubad style drills. And he taught us a little bit of dog boxing, monkey boxing stuff that yeah. was wonderful. A little, I remember a staff form that he taught us. And yeah. he taught the um, uh, the Hakuturu, uh, your Hakuturu and the uh, Wanduan kata as well but although i haven't practiced that in so many years i can't really yeah, yeah. revive it so but... you know so uh i'm in year 11 at high school uh at sir wilford laurier in uh scarborough in, in ontario canada and he and he was he was in year nine 
uh, at Cedar Bray Collegiate, uh, which was, and, and interestingly enough, let's say one school's here, those school's here. We both lived in the middle, but he lived on the opposite side of the street of me. And so oh, wow. because of city council, I had to go to this school, he went sure. to the other school. And I was, in spite of how I look today, I was uh, this uh, extremely passionate uh, uh, gymnast. Uh, I was on the wrestling team, the gymnastics team, and played, and played football. And oh, uh, wow. His high school had this remarkable uh, uh, gymnasium for gymnastics. Our school, it, it was good. And we had a great coach, by the way. Mr. Jacobson was a great coach. But I just loved their facility. So I used to sneak up and uh, uh, on, our, on our off days, our training, and sneak into the gym and train over there, you know. And uh, that's, where I met, that's where I met Ron, by the way. And How cool. Yeah, we just we just started practicing, and uh, and I'll just keep this story short because I'll go off on a tangent. But uh, so uh, <clears throat> I had uh, there was a issue in my family. I come from a very dysfunctional family, and not surprisingly, and uh, I was uh, uh, in 1973. Uh, sorry, end of 1972, I had an issue where I, I had to leave school and my home, and. Uh, I just around that time, I bumped into the what I I refer to it these days as the traveling circus. It was the it was the Pylum group, you know, with uh, Daniel Pai and and I was uh, doing a demonstration uh, uh, on a I guess what you call it the platform of a uh, of a uh, uh, drive-in theater. I guess you call it. Sure. And I, I was pretty handy with the nunchaku back in the day, and I. And I screwed up my nunchaku floor where I, I had this move where I flip it around my back and I catch it in my hand here. And I and I and I it had uh, slipped out of my hand as I was coming around, and the upward momentum made it sail up. And I just I didn't even look up and I went, I was thinking in my head, I went, oh God, this is it. And it landed in my hand. And I woke, and then right away I just, you know, I was like carrying on. I meant to do that. Later, <laughs> yeah, that opened up the door for me to to meet these guys, and I I kind of ran away with the Kung Fu Circus, so to speak, you know, and and I was uh, uh, basically, you know, between London, Ontario, Hartford, Connecticut, and Morgantown, West Virginia, I was gone for like a year. Oh, wow. And when I came back uh, uh, for Christmas one year, uh, the Christmas of 73, uh, and then I was going back to Morgantown uh, or Hartford, uh, they wouldn't let me cross the border, you know. In those days, you know, you just had to show a simple ID, and, right. and I had like $25 in my pocket, and uh, my my backpack with my gi in it and, and they said no you have no money no return ticket and you know you're not american so we're not gonna let you cross the border and i remember contacting ron and saying yeah you know i got this problem and and he goes hey you know your problem might be uh our salvation he said since you've been gone i've been training at this kung fu club down on 1561 o'clock drive in east york it's called yaolung kung fu center and there are three chinese partners uh, Bill Jong, uh, uh, Wu Long Ong, who's Indonesian Chinese, by the way, and uh, Mo Chow. And they just got, and, the, and and so between the three of them, they brought together uh, 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 some type of silat. I forgot, uh, uh, Pujimi Kuntao Pukulon, I think is what it was, uh, with Ong and, uh, you know, heavily into Chinese medicine at the time. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, Mo was uh, a dull pie stylist and a ho, uh, chuli fat. And uh, I think, I'm not sure if it was ho, I think he was a, a Hong Sing chuli fat. And, uh, and do, I don't know if you know what dull pie is. Remind me and I'll ask you later to tell you a very interesting style. I think uh, I know his son. His son is still active. Mo Chao? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I, he... I never met him. Okay. But, you know, our mutual friend, Susan Borkowski, knows him very well, speaks extremely highly. Ian, Ian, Chow, I Ian, think his name That's is. That's the one. Yes, yes. I and met I, Ian. I I've, never had, I've never had the pleasure of meeting him, but I guess he's following the footsteps of yeah. his dad. His dad was, well, that's sort of that is, you know, he's still alive. Yeah. Remarkable martial arts. But they had a parting of the ways at the time. Okay. The two partners and Mo Chow had a parting of the ways. So, like I said, I didn't know any of them, but I, I knew that they were from the Hong Lak Kung Fu Club on uh, Dundas Street on the other side of Spadina, which I knew very well back in the day. And uh, Ron said to me, he says, yeah, he said, Mo was the chief instructor. They're looking for, a... and these other two partners were not, they were working working partners. They were not actually, uh, sorry, they were uh, 
right. uh, private, uh, Southern Partners. Right, right. And they, the new chief instructor at the school. And he said, this might be, you know. So I, I went down and met them and uh, applied for the position. And they said, well, we're not looking for a chief instructor. We're looking for a third partner now. And uh, I didn't have any money. Though. I had like $25 in my that's right. all the money that's my name. I was 19 years old. And uh, he said, uh, well, he said, so he said, come and teach a class and we'll watch you. And I taught a class and they said, oh, wow, yeah. Uh, and, you know, those days I would, I had been, oh, my God, I was I was like a Heinz 57 in those days, especially having been in the States for a year, you know. And then prior to that, I had some Silat training and, uh, you know, oh. from the karate background. And, and uh, I had played with, because we knew friends from, Wing Chun uh, and of course the Honga, uh, the Hungar guys and uh, I guess you you know Robin Young now have you yes. met Robin yes I yes, have so Robin was just so when I used to go to the school back in the day and you know I came up to the Canadian Karate Kung Fu Association with him John uh, uh, Shaolin Fistway right which is kind of an offshoot of a of Hungar and Robin's club was upstairs on Hagman Street just around the corner from City Hall off of Dundas Street. It's funny, I was just talking about the story there, there and we'll, we'll talk about the Bubishi, uh, because where I got my first copy of the Bubishi was just right back around the corner next to the Sum Sing restaurant in this Chinese bookstore back in the day for like $2.50. It was a the Taiwan pirate copy of... Uh, Mabuni's. Mabuni yeah, a study of Seifai copy. So, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah, so anyway, I mean, we were, I was doing that. I was doing that. Uh, I was doing a... Um, so, you know, Hogar's Hong Hei Gong, uh, of course, there are Wong Fei Hong places and everything. Then there's this Lam, Lam Sai Wing. And then, of course, there's this migration to Hong Kong, mm -hmm. you know, about the 20s because of uh, Chiang Kai shek. And, uh, and that's where you get all the Fuchian guys going to Taiwan, by the way. And right. Although, although I'm going to talk to about something new I just discovered in Taiwan. Uh, and then, of course, so the Hong Kong, Guan, Guan, down to Guangdong and then over to, you know, Macau, Hong Kong, that area. So, I mean, we were literally playing with. Everything, all these southern styles, uh, white eyebrow, dragon boxing, uh, Wing Chun, uh, white crane, yeah. gar, five answers of fist, you know. Yeah. And so I, I couldn't tell you at what at, at that moment what I was, what style I was, but Pai loved that because Pai's method, you know, he was okay, he was a sorry, a Hawaiian Kempo guy, would, but you know, there's a very interesting Russian quote about ambition that kind of goes something, you know guys who are, you know, focused on going somewhere, you know, we're not concerned with where they're going. It's their history or their past that keeps changing. And I I thought, Pai's methodology at that time, you know, and if you, if you now, and I doubt seriously whether he would have ever even envisioned the idea that the internet and, and uh, our able, our ability to source uh, original information would then would be what it is now, right? So, but we now see him, you know, in, in a gi back in the day, right? You know, Prius and all those guys, you know. So yes, yes. So it's interesting here. So the point I wanted to make was his his idea for, and I'm sure you know because he was he was hanging around with Bruce Lee and guys like that back in the day. So I'm sure that his mentality toward innovation and eclectism was pretty right, you know, and so. Being that his method was very mobile, very symbiotic at the time, he was taking from every source he could, you know. And and he, I mean, even to this day, some of my favorite forms are, you know, Fu Hock Xiang Ying, uh, Goji, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Tiger Crane, Double uh -huh. Star, yeah, yeah, Monk Dames the Tiger, you know, a uh, 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 five four, a uh, ten four fist, yeah, yeah, one. yeah. So they were just uh, McCarthy. You, you you go to Morgantown, teach this, um, do 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 this, and. Ron and I uh, would have a laugh many years later that some of the, not some of the, I should be careful what I'm saying. I forgot what we recorded, right? <laughs> because, uh, you know, a lot of the guys who come generations later don't know any of this type of stuff. They don't know how a lot of this came in before Pi started to build. This is going to be uniquely mine. Right. Because right. before there was a real, a real sundry of, uh, of uh, stuff coming from, oh my gosh, all the styles that you could possibly imagine. So we were we were talking about Mo Chow and me getting into the school and Ian and and I just jumped off the bandwagon a little bit, but uh, based upon that class that I taught and then a subsequent interview, they said, "Look, I, we I, you don't have any money, but here's what we're going to do: we're going to pay you two hundred fifty dollars a week in cash, 
for teaching. Uh, we're going to take $200 of that, put me back every week. We're going to leave with a $50 a week uh, stipend. Uh, I was going to live at the club downstairs. There was uh, some spare rooms. Uh, live, in, live in the Mogun, uh, teach. And that, was, that became my very first full-time position. Although I've been teaching for Pi the year before, it was my full-time settled down back in Canada. Wow. And that's where I started, you know, and that's, and that was the, and, and that was, so, so that's, oh, uh, that's 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Okay. What a great, what a great start. So you were doing karate uh, before that. You were. You oh, were yeah. Yeah. Hey, and by the way, I prepared something for you today, by the way. I, I uh, sorry, I didn't get a chance to go through all the questions, by the way. No, no this. worries. But, uh, but we, we can did. go anywhere you like with this. Yeah, good. Okay. So first of all, let me show, show you this book. Okay. Now, yeah. now I, I just want to show you that over the years, I I got it signed. So I have got oh, signatures cool. and uh, and uh, you know Oyama's, you know. Oh yeah, sorry, so sorry. So this cool. is this is a 1957. Uh, what is karate by uh, Oyama Masatsu, right? Yes. And uh, just before I tell you about this this book, I want to show you that isn't it interesting that. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, yeah, you do go through, right? There, right. There's a Mr. Soul. Soul, oh, yes. Made, some right. people call Sunny, Sunny Chu, but Soul, Mr. Soul, a uh, Korean who was a student at Mitsude, uh, uh, Mitsumekan University in Kyoto at the time. Right. He would be the real backbone behind Goju there, as you know. But right. being a Korean, of course, he never got any. Uh, Didn't he get the credit. Social recognition, as you know, because of the uh, right. uh, summit, uh, discrimination, you know. Right, but, but one thing that I can tell you about this book that's totally fascinating is, oh yeah, and and in the back part, you know, there's the part of of Oyama coming to the United States for his wrestling tour and his demonstrations uh, as part of the wrestling team, and the Togo Brothers. Well, I'll tell you about that if you don't know about it. A, I I a, don't actually. I'm that's right. interesting. Here's a, here's more of these pictures uh, of him with the wrestling group. Uh, you know, my my dear British friend Graham Noble. Uh, remind me later or off, off camera or something. I'll, I'll send you a, a wonderful article that he did. I don't want to say it was an export, but I mean, a lot of, I remember when I published it back in in my journals back in the day, I remember a lot of Kyokushin guys got quite angry with me and they were, you know, who's this guy we're going to beat him up type of mentality. And I went, hey, I said, you know, guys, Onko Chishin, study the past, understand the present with regards to the future, and especially how the chant past people tend to consume, seal it. I said, this is this is who he was. This is what he did. And, right. and, uh, and then later when that all became known, it all died down. Nobody wanted to know much more about it. Yeah. This is Peter Urban uh, doing self-defense techniques. Oh, with wow. Yeah. As you know, Peter Urban is my senpai under Richard Kim. And oh, just, a, just a quick story. You know, you, know I, you can read about it. I published it on my website uh, long ago. It's still, I've just left it up there in a PDF. Uh, you know, Richard Kim was kind of like a long lost. He was like almost like a father relationship to me because of the dysfunctional family I sure. came from. And you know, I became a student in the seventies and uh, in the mid seventies, and and uh, you know, it was a best of times and the worst of times, type of speak. You know, and I was at I was at this event one time, and uh, you know, we we're, I, you know, I just got out of one cult. You know, we used to have little tattoos on our hand, the little dragon tattoos from the from the fire dragon group that I was with. It was a Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Don't even start as a, and then, then I kind of jumped into another one. And uh, we all have this sense of wanting to belong to something, oh, you know. Of and course. That, and that it's... behavior is something I'd like to talk to you about later because it's one that's, I don't say misdiagnosed, but folks don't often, they, they're, they're without even, it's like when they come, people come to Japan for the first time. They've never been here before. They don't know much about our culture, uh, not culture. And They'll go back to their Western country and they say, I had such a marvelous time. My goodness, it was, a, I met this guy. I did, I never paid for anything. And the master picked me up and I got these gifts. And I want to, I want to go back and repeat that over and over again. And they, and, and, and they think long and hard, what was it? And they will focus on the, uh, the symptoms, symptoms, probably the wrong word, rather than the source. Oh, I felt so good. He treated me like this. I got that. I did that. And then, but the focus of attention was 
they don't know what exactly was it. So in the West, we come from a very confrontational society, you know, and in the East is a Confucian-based, typically conformist-based culture. So um, um, what? I, and long before I read the work of a Belgian by the name of uh, Boy Lafayette de Men, wrote a book called uh, Kata, uh, All You Need to Know About Doing Business with the Japanese. And uh, gosh, I wish I ever read that book before I immigrated to Japan. But it talks a lot about uh, Tatemai and Honde. These are two cultural phenomena which exist. Oh, you know what they mean? You know? I, I think I do, but I, I'll, I'm uh, listening. Tatemai literally means uh, facade, uh, you know, what you see on the surface. Uh, and then Honde means the truth, right? And so, you know, there's this wonderful uh, description of Japanese culture. Oh, they call it wa, like wa do ri, wa wa. Right, harmony. harmony yep. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, they say this is a, uh, uh, the Japanese idea of living in harmony with uh, uh, nature and your fellow man. And, um, I, however, I prefer Carl Van Wolveren's uh, um, uh, explanation in his uh, uh, Band in Japan book, a treatise called uh, Enigma of Japanese Power. I, I, it might, I might be wrong. I think it maybe page 243 footnote. His uh, definition of wa was more along the lines of a, uh, uh, a contrived or massaged willingness to place uh, personal desire be behind communal tranquility. Sure. And uh, you are, you know, everything in Japanese culture fits into a box, by the way. You know, how you eat food, uh, uh, here, 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 how I how I hand a business card to somebody. And then it's, a, I... it's, a, it's a kata. Everything is a kata. Oh, yeah, yeah, everything, everything is kata. <laughs> so, so you know, right? And so, so here's the point is, here in Japan, there's no threat to your insecurities. That's as simple as that. But it, it's very difficult to quantify that because uh, nobody's saying, hey, Hey, don't worry. You can be anywhere you want in Japan. Nobody really cares. Or if they do care, they'll never let you know. They'll, you know, just they'll you know, think they're your best friend. And often you will see two people or two companies doing business together, and you know they don't like each other. And, right. But you would never be able to tell because of the facade, you know. Sure. And that's a very uh, that's a misunderstood uh, entity here in this culture, and it's one that's it's one that uh, uh, folks coming here either for the first time or planning on visiting or staying for. A considerable period of time should should learn something about anyway. Yeah. So I, I was talking about uh, Peter Urban and Richard Kim. So I went to this event out on the West Coast in in uh, Tacoma, and a guy who I'd known, the tournament promoter, said he he said to me something like, "Yeah, McCarthy, you're not a bad guy. I you know I've got the channel. Why are you hanging out with this guy Richard Kim?" And I went, "Excuse me, you know, yeah, he's like a plagiarist." And I went, "Bang, you know." The, the old days, you know. Yeah, 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 definitely. Back, back to the old days. Yeah. And, you know, when you couldn't hide behind a keyboard, so to speak, right? Totally. And, uh, and I remember, you know, saying a few choice words to him about talking about my master that way. And, and him, needless to say, I wasn't welcome back there again. But uh, naive me, I, then, I remember going to see my teacher after that at another function back in Toronto the following month and say, hey, Sensei, I met this guy. And, you know, he said that you plagiarize his book, Weapons Warriors. And um, yeah, I just, I would not stand for that, sir. I, I, I protected your honor, sir. You know, you're all good soldier, good soldier. <laughs> and then, of course, I came back to Vancouver. And I, all of his little inner circles started treating me differently, let's say, until that differently ultimately led to me being thrown out. Ah. Deru kui wa utareru, or deru kui wa utareru, remember the protruding nail? Oh, oh yes, yes. I was the protruding nail, you know. I, I, I guess I was. And uh, I wasn't realizing, I didn't realize that I was uh, on a very sensitive subject. I didn't know anything at the time, uh, which I would later go and find out about Ken Shockey, uh, one of Kim's students, being in the States, uh, being in, uh, uh, in the military based out of Okinawa while he was... Uh, uh, doing this tour of duty in Vietnam. And then becoming a student of Shimabukuro Ezo and Shimabukuro Ezo and then getting a little copy of his book, you know, his, his book was about uh, Rukyu Kings and Karate Masters, uh, which is where this Weaponless Warriors is based, right? So by, long story short, when I find out that the guy was right, 
I go back with my tail between my legs, you know, and using the magic formula, you know, like I'm, I'm extremely sorry. Uh, I, uh, yeah, you know, I deserve what I get. And uh, uh, I just hopefully uh, wonder if there's something I might be able to do to help put this behind us and uh, maybe we can move on together. Look, our relationship was never the same after that, by the way. But he said, one thing I like about McCarthy, man, he wears his uh, heart on his sleeve and he, he, he shoots it straight, man. You can't get any more transparent than me. And, and that was a very, very interesting story. So, so uh, my relation with Richard came after that was very uh, uh, touchy, very sensitive, very... Uh, by the way, he opened up much more to me after that, by the way, you know, especially when he found out I was immigrating to Japan. It always reminds me now, especially when I'm watching Shogun again, Clavel's new... Uh, yeah, uh, I haven't again. started yet, but I've, I've, I'm waiting for some time. You know what you want to do? This is a matter of interest. Go back and watch, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Kill... Uh, Dr. Kill, there's a... Uh, Richard Chamberlain and Toshio right. Mifuni. Uh, reenact the first one to get a really good grip on this. I am really enjoying this one now because when I watched the other one back in 1980, uh, my understanding of Japanese culture was uh, nowhere near as as right. it is now. Yeah. So so what they were doing was so. I remember. Do you remember? Do you know uh, Dale Kirby by any chance? The name sounds familiar. I'm sorry. Uh, he was a na former national uh, weapons champion back in the day when uh, when the uh, all the radios from Karate Illustrated. Sure, sure. And he was a guy who, he was kind of a little bit of a mentor to me as well. Oh, cool. He had been very profoundly moved by uh, uh, the Shogun series and uh, fashioned his swordsmanship after that Mifuni thing, you know, of, of uh, Lord Thor and I was in Tokugawa. Yeah. And, um, and he, uh, I remember he taught me how to, he was the first guy who taught me how to tie my hakama my, and my sageo correctly cool. and and uh, we we'd actually had a we had a, we had a kind of a mutual idol, if you will. I have a cousin who lives out in uh, a place called Gananoque, Ontario, and he was a he's a world uh, famous skydiver. You know, with with thousands and thousands of jumps, and sure. he was the guy who uh, 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 forged uh, relative canopy work back in the day. You know. Uh, and that was one of the designers of the Pegasus wing and stuff like that. Oh, wow. From a commander shooting. Yeah. Dale Kirby is a is a, uh, a a professional skydiver as well. So when he knew that, you know, we kind of put this together, I kind of became a little, a little extra close to him, by the way. Ooh. And so anyway, the, the point is this is I've been establishing this recognition and then, you know, uh, and winning as a champion and then deciding to go to Japan. And, and Mr. Kim knew that I was, you know, uh, a, you know, McCarthy's the type of guy that when he wants to learn or know something, there is no nook or cranny he won't look in or stone he right. won't look underneath in order to find what he's looking for. So I think Kim, like the samurai of Shogun, who, you know, give away daughters and sons and cousins and as as either uh, as either hostages or go marry my enemy to keep it together, he would become the godfather for my, my children and, wow. uh, you know, keep that in code. And anyway, uh, and we had, uh, you know, I still, in my drawer, uh, more than 100 handwritten letters from him. And oh, guys wow. like Professor Willie J were my former jiu-jitsu teacher. Sure. Very cool. But, I, I, but, but the point is leading up to this. After he passed away, I had two people uh, reach out to me. One was uh, Charlie Gooden from, uh, sorry, Charles Gooden from oh. Hawaii, as you all well know, uh, a lovely person. Yeah. Who, yeah. A very sincere martial art practitioner and a wonderful collection of books from the martial art library there in Hawaii. And then, of course, I was another guy from uh, New Zealand. Uh, his name is John Finlayson, who had also been corresponding with Richard Kim. And they both reached out to me and said, oh, uh, Patrick, uh, you know, and they these guys knew nothing about it. That was long before I published any of this stuff. They said, oh, we had some correspondence from your late teacher in which your name was mentioned. Would you would you like a copy? Oh, yeah, well, sure. of course. My name was mentioned. I just want to read you know, Patrick McCarthy, you know, that bastard, you know, betrayed me. Um, or or he walks on water. You never know. <laughs> well, you know, the joke is with, with the, the amount of detractors that I've managed to gain over the years was if McCarthy can walk on water, it's because a bastard can't swim, you know, <laughs> quoting the Iron Maiden. You know? And so uh, I I was always at fault for doing something or other, you know. Sure. And, uh, and little did I know at the time it was because I was successful or becoming successful, you know. 
So anyway, in the letter, here's the interesting point is Richard Kim says to both of these guys who don't know each other at separate times over the course of the relationship, he said, and, and by the way, <laughs> sorry, this all, <laughs> this is an example of talking to me, you know, we're, we haven't even got to the question. We're already like two hours in or so. Yeah, we're good. It's great. We're talking about Peter Urban right. in the Smelson Yamas book, which I'm getting to accommodate in the moment. Seven directions bring it together. I like that. And uh, he says, he goes, and Richard Kim says, amidst the thousands of students I have had the pleasure of teaching over the years, uh, two of my most senior and top students are Peter Urban and Patrick McCarthy. I just I remember. I remember reading that and going, wow. Well, God, you know, after all the things I said about him. <laughs> Which well, too, by the way, I, I've never, yes. never. And uh, so I thought, oh my gosh. And I, I said, oh, I got to go back online and uh, change that. And I said, nah, I don't. Leave it the way it is. Let the cards fall where they may, and we'll take it from there. So, so uh, Peter Urban, who, you know, I started back in the 60s, by the way. So who would know? I even know who these guys were, right? So that Peter Urban, and I just got to get this next one is uh, the next one is the best, right? By the way, the next one is the best. Sorry, I put my glasses back on. Um, uh, this is the this this one is really the the, the oh gosh, I hope, I hope I can find. I should have I should have put uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, little uh, stickies in it so that uh, oh, maybe. No worries. So you could have ah, I got here it is. And and this is on page uh, 74. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's Richard Kim and Mas Oyama Mastatsu doing doing two person self defense drills together. That's awesome. Yeah. So and then of course there's Yamaguchi Gogan in here sparring and uh and uh so okay. So and by the way just as a matter of a footnote uh, I'm going to tell you in a minute that this is the book that my first teacher used to use to get our next lesson. And, oh, okay. Uh, uh, Mai Geri, uh, uh, Tomi Tomitsuke, uh, Mawate Genambarai, uh, Ich Ni Tipo, and then he, he'd go over and go. Oh, my goodness. And Mawate uh, Uchi Uke Soto Age, and I remember <laughs> the book. Wow, I I thought I only had those bad experiences, no, no, Hanshi. So. No, so, but there's something to be said about somebody who's kind of self-taught, and I mean, sorry, he he obviously has but he only he only ever went to Greenbelt. Sure, and he was wow. a student. His name was Adrian Gomes. He was a student at UNB at the time, along with his girlfriend and and some of the friends who made up the core of this logo. I'll tell you about that later, but. So this was the book he used. Now jump ahead a bunch of years, you know. And my as I got older, you know, you tend to think more fondly of you know your your younger years, and you know I'm just applying once again. I used to be a permanent resident in Japan when I lived there for a decade right. back between the eighties and nineties, but then of being called off to Australia and then coming back. So I've only been here four years now, and, I, and my, you know so my wife is Japanese, and my kids live mm -hmm. here and stuff like that. So now I want to apply for permanent residency and I don't have a sponsor because, you know, we're in our seventies, so we don't have a, we're not, I'm not working for anybody. I have my own business. Right. Right. So they kind of consider me retired. What's your source of income? And I said, well, I'm, I, I run an organization and, you know, we have a lot of members around the world and, you know, so we have a membership and, and, and I have students who pay dues and there's yeah. the books and oh, right. yeah, I wrote a bunch of books. So they've asked me to quantify uh, what my portfolio is and i i don't know if it's just i've been too busy uh in my life doing whatever it is i do i had never thought about and you know oftentimes even when i had people applying for jobs to teach for me and things like that or when i was at the college god i'd sit down and read a I'd read a, a, a cv this thick on some academic you know jesus with a seven thousand footnotes and uh, his bibliography was uh, was a book itself you know and right. i like I've never done that. I've never, you know, I've right. never, I, I didn't have that academic background, right? Yeah, so, that, right. so just in the last few months, I've been putting together, you know me, I love photographs, by the way. Yeah. Please ask me later, you know, oh, McCarthy, I got a million photographs. Ask me why I take photographs. I'll, I'll tell you, for, uh, so other folks can, 
get why the taking the photos was so important for me. So I started putting this together and I was going, holy, holy smokes. I didn't realize I actually wrote all these articles. Yeah. I had no idea. I wrote all these articles and for all these different magazines. Yeah. And 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 and, and then, you know, it's it's a real tap on the back when somebody says, Oh, we'd like to write an article on you. Like, on me? Oh. And then on one half of my brain we were thinking, get do the article right away because pretty soon they might realize that you're not who you're saying you are. Yes, of course, I'll do the article, you know. And then and then the article turns into a feature article, and then somebody says, We'd like to put you on the cover of the magazine. I go, hang on. You know, I it has been a, a realization for me, Hanchi, that uh even the most powerful people I've met and famous people, the reality is practically everybody, we're all the same. Almost everybody suffers from some form of imposter syndrome. You you don't believe your own success or abilities until you really test them, and other people help you rise to your your level of ability and your aspirations. Or pull you down. Or pull you down, right? <laughs> Try to cut you off of the knees, but yeah. Why? It's, it's... Why? You know, always like, why? Is it my wife, my wife, and my one of my former students is a brilliant man, Roland Gill. Thank you so much. Um, and we, they say to me, they say, you know, you just got back off of a four month, uh, 30 seminar tour. You, 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 you know, you're on the cover of this, you did that, you've got this award, you've done this. And yet you're focusing on that guy down in Georgia who called you an asshole. You know? <laughs> I, I, been, say, no, I, just say, I just I used to have this thing. I say, well, you know, if the guy just knew me, he wouldn't say that because I, if I could just talk to him. You know, because when you write words, it doesn't. It's very difficult to convey the the nuance or the the sentiment that you want. You know, yeah. and people always get. I didn't realize, you know, how how sensitive or insecure people can be about certain things. You know, yeah. and uh, now it's I, you know it's that uh, no regrets, but I wish I knew then what I know now. I would have handled that uh, situation much differently. And uh, I think it's all, all our uh, our uh, inability to see the clarity of an issue for what it is because we tend to you know whether it's conditional bias or or whether it's uh not understanding the reality of what it represents or or somebody misleading you to uh for a self-serving issue that you decide to uh jump on a horse and go in one direction but i thought you know if i could just explain to that person that here's why i made that deduction or oh, that's I, i'm you know you know we'll talk about my happy theory later as well but you know, when I, when I, and I, and I had been dancing around this happy theory for years and years. And by the time, by the time I just woke up one day, I went, you know, it actually, one against one, empty handed, uh, domestic in a civil, uh, mm -hmm. domestic society, not battlefield, not right. arena, not competition, not war, because those training methods have to be different for that. And the mentality and behavior is completely different. Although there's lots of crossovers because if a guy grabs your throat, it does, you know, blindfold and what is that a military or the what spot? You know, you it's a transfer of kinetic energy and right. you either know how to deal with it or you don't. But when I got onto that and I said, you know, and please make a little note for us to talk about uh pride or pride. Sorry. We became known as pride, but we were the UWFI before that, and then we were submission wrestlers before that, and then shoot fighters before that. So and talk about my little uh, epiphany uh, one day, which has now become known as the snake pit uh, in Tokyo for me to understand uh, more, so much more about kata. You know, it has to do with uh, my early days with uh, Chisaro Wing Chun and uh, uh, and uh, these two person drills, which we, which would be like what you see in the 48 postures of the Bubishi. And uh, and then of course, my, my years with Katori Shintaru, how two person, how attacks are negotiated. And so all of this kind of comes together to create a, the, a platform upon which you see the mechanics and the principles, which they never change, you know. And so, but anyway, let me combine this and then we'll, and we'll start the interview, right? So many years later, I, I said, oh, I, I'd love to get a copy of this book, you know. And uh, so I reached, I put feelers out to my friends and, and so on. And a, a young man from California reached out to me and said, I have a copy of the book. I'd be happy to, uh, you know, uh, give you a copy of the book. And I went, oh, his name was uh, 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 Christopher Thomas Ford, uh, Thomas Christopher Ford. Uh, he was a, um, 
a student of uh, Tanashi Yamashita, Kobayashi Shoriro. He's a filmmaker as well. He's the guy who sent me this particular book. And I swear to God, not more than a week or two after I got this book, I got another. I got a second book, Aww. which I would then sell. Yeah, sure, sure. And That's then wonderful. to contribute the, the funds to another a worthy source, by the way. So cool. this book represents the first style of karate I ever did. But in order to really truly appreciate this, you gotta you gotta get this. So it's uh, it's. Uh, um, my uh, so I'm I'm around uh, my my birthday's in December so uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't be ten years old yet I would still be nine okay we start school uh, uh, at the end of the first weekend of, of September Labor Day weekend the Monday uh, the, the the first day following uh, in in North America where you go by the way you know, it's different here of course in Japan and. Uh, and I remember, we, you know, there's always an assembly, you know, on the first day back. Hey, welcome back, everybody. You know, this year, la, 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 la. And, uh, and uh, hey, today we have some entertainers. So this person's going to sing you a song. And we're going to show you a film. And uh, the, the, the singer was a, a, a Canadian girl. Uh, uh, her name was Buffy St. Marie. And she would sing a song for us. And later, later she, would, she would go on to become... Very famous, you know. She, I think, Woodstock, Dylan, all that. She became very cool. well in that era, and um, and you know, we all sang along to the song. And then uh, lights out. It was a, a National Film Board of Canada documentary film we were going to watch, right? So and the film was called Judoka, and it was the film that uh, highlighted the uh, career of a Canadian airline pilot named Doug Rogers. Who had been winning a lot of uh, judo competitions uh, at the time, Canadian championship, world championships, and so on, and then he was off to the Olympics. And you know the story was he he would go to Japan for six weeks, but he would wind up stay for six years, and he of course became a a, 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 a uchideshi of uh, uh, sorry a living uh, a disciple student uh, mm -hmm. of uh, a Kimura Kimura Sensei. The, the, that hey, he's got a Kamora, you know. That's yeah, a, yeah. Kimura, by the way, and uh, yeah. So, and the training in those years was, I mean, you know, and it's come on, I'm a kid, I'm nine years old, and you know, we all love, we all love, you know, running away with fantasy. What's 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 the expression? Uh, many of us spend uh, much of our life uh, dreaming or searching for a portal into a magical kingdom type of thing you know that, sure. that mentality yeah so i i love uh, you know my 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 relaxation was uh movies i love movies you know hercules samson you know the art space of yeah. America, and superman batman you know these oh, are yeah. and but we we all knew that that was just that's not real you know right. that was, that was fantasy release you know and uh, i could get lost uh you know in the cinema or a book or something mm -hmm. or, or uh, you know a little bit here I'm actually watching a, a transformation of a human being. I'm going, and that was I was like a deer caught in the headlights at night. Boom! I just I was like, and it was based upon that film that I went out to ask my mom, I want to do that. And you know, kids of that era, you know, where we lived outdoors. By the way, you know, I remember summer vacations as a kid. Be back before uh, uh, dark. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, for the day. Luckily like, enough, I was. Uh, I, I'm of the era where I still enjoyed that as well. So I feel I feel bad for kids in modern era that don't get that oh, freedom. Don't even get me started. On yeah. That yeah so, that's... Anyway, so that was that was the beginning, and and uh, it was uh, so judo. The Saint John Judo Club was the thing, and the funny part about it was there was a the the the, the classes. The only just started. The classes were shifting over to uh, from the uh, from the uh, Shimukan Dojo over to the uh, YMCA. Which was a great facility, by the way, as a kid, you know, you can imagine. And I, it's, it's, I probably get the story wrong every time, but it was something like this: the kids' class was going to start at a certain time, and I showed up at the wrong time. And and being a kid and not knowing, you know, who, who we were, and I, going into the the dojo or the wrestling room, which is where the dojo was, and the guy who would be teaching using this book and his, you know, eight or ten students, all adults or adults, you know. Older teenagers and young young twenties. Right. right. The guy saying, "You know, you're here for the ICA." He goes, "You're you're late. Get in class." Like, oh, yes. 
yes, hand sign, you know, and running into the class and, and then being told the class starts at the eight, not eight forty, or you know, I go, yes, sir, I'm so sorry. And and everybody goes and and I'm I'm going to punch it. We didn't, I hadn't done any punching you, but it must be a new part of our training. And then and then leaving, and then I'm leaving watching the well, the classmates coming and going, okay, something's wrong here. McCarthy, what, where are you going? The class starts in 10 minutes. Oh, oh gosh. So that's, and that's how I, that's how I, you know, went from judo into karate. Wow. <laughs> that's why this book, I, I keep this book uh, as that's a, awesome. uh, as a link, uh, a bridge to the past that links the past to the present. So it's that's always, very cool. Uh, yeah. And, and especially that, I mean, it was up and down the floor with mindless, Yes. repetitions of basic techniques and you know not ever realizing at the time that really the the, the real key to mastery was the, the repetition <laughs> the repetition of basic foundation skills you know and right. uh, me not knowing that there was anything more than that in the first place you know so right right so, uh mr ford thank you so much for the book and uh i'm happy i got that on uh that's on, very cool let's start the interview <laughs> well thank you so much for sharing that you know i I mean, obviously, I've been a fan of your work for many, many years, uh, Anji, since I since I found out about you and then I started, you know, some a handful of correspondence with you, which you were always incredibly generous to even write back to me as I was asking silly questions as a as a late teenager about, oh, uh, white crane and goju and all kinds of things that, you know, we're still still just starting to be uncovered. But, you know, for today, I really wanted to dive a little bit more in your Chinese background, a little bit of your thoughts about comparison of your studies in Kung Fu, along with your uh, your incredible um, career in uh, karate and really being a forerunner of, of a whole new wave of kind of functional practices in traditional martial arts, especially karate. And then, of course, I'd love to dive into as much you, as uh, you can tell us about your um, your journey in discovering the Bubishi, translating it, your understanding of it, and how you've incorporated that understanding in your teachings in Kori Uchinati, and then even and then your most recent discoveries as you've gone and and looked at that more original copy. So, uh, anywhere you'd like to start, anywhere in there, uh, you know, not not more original copy. It is the original. Very cool. And I, when we when we get to the part about talking about the Mubishi, I'm going to share some fascinating revelations. I look Fact. look forward to that. You know, as I say, uh, 1974, the Chinese bookstore next to the Samsung. Actually, I went into the store with a guy named Ken Talik. I don't you know, you know Ken. I've heard of yeah. him. Yes, Ken, Ken and I. Ken and I were classmates together back in the day. Actually, actually, we were actually roommates together as well. And and we went to the states together. And so we, we've known each other literally since childhood. And, uh, and uh, you know, and we used to, you know, go with, we, we would love, uh, back in those days, what was it? Uh, uh, you know, well, you know, I was always great with languages, by the way. And also, I had a crush on this, uh, a Chinese waitress in the a Chinese. That's service. motivation for you. <laughs> oh, I, I was at that restaurant all the time, you know, uh, beef and tomatoes, uh, steamed ribs, barbecue sauce, you know, and, and but, but the bookstores, they said, we would just go in and get lost in the bookstore, yeah. get lost, go, and you know, we couldn't read Chinese or anything at the time, but we'd look at all the pictures, you know, and then, so that, uh, that uh, desire, that passion, you, you're talking about, you know, me talking to you, I'm just, how can you turn your back on a like-minded person uh, in pursuit of common goals? You know, age is irrelevant, you know. Uh, and so, yeah, that was always me. And I, and I did that for years with so many people. Um, I look at a lot of times that never really turned out at the end, you know, but uh, sure. And, and, and it has, say, hardened me up or made me more cautious. I don't have the time these days I used to in the old days, you know, when I was first starting out to spend with folks I don't know, but I try to do as much as I can because I love, I love giving and I love, uh, you know, I believe that giving back into what has empowered you is in fact giving as well, you know, so but that's for another, another thing. So, uh, okay. So, uh, uh, what was the first question you wanted to ask oh, me? Oh, just was anything you, yeah, sure. If, uh, you know, I've, I found it 
to be a bit different in training uh, karate and kung fu and different cultural aspects, different ways of teaching, right, right. things of those things. I'd be curious what your experiences are there, what you could share with us. Okay, so so let me jump back a little bit, first of all, uh, just as, uh, had you asked me this question prior to me accepting that position in Australia to go down and write, um, what, actually what would, what would then be the world's first uh, undergraduate program uh, for uh, martial arts instructors accreditation. And I know that obviously there's going to be this. Here's the thing about having a little bit of information or listening to somebody without getting the facts. You know, when I was doing or later, when I would talk about this college course, there was, oh, yeah, so and so at the University of so and so had that same course. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Uh, so and so at such and such a university might have had uh, part of their subject dealing with uh, some part of the culture, but as a completely systematized uh, uh, program that focused explicitly on the martial arts. No, there, there wasn't. And the point being, in this is because I had. Uh, uh, accepted this job offer. We can talk about that later, how, how I got it, if you like. I'd be happy to put it on record for folks to, to understand that. I remember when I got got there into, into, into Australia, was sitting, uh, and, you know, uh, by the time I would ultimately be, you know, sponsored by the uh, Australian College of Natural Medicine, sitting in the Faculty of Education, and it was a full faculty, well, full faculty. Remember, this, this uh, institute was the leading um, a facility imparting traditional Chinese medicine uh, and uh, uh, anything to do with the therapies uh, uh, and acupuncture and so on. So, and it was it wasn't the only college, but it was the leading college at the time. So, I'm sitting in their faculty uh, with a course writer helping me to write this course. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> like, I mean. I thought in, in the beginning when I was listening to the guy uh, describe the outcomes of what this position was, it was, me, it was going to be me and their teaching. And I, I'm very passionate. I'm a very passionate teacher. And it's, I, you know, it's, what, it's, it's 60 years this year. You know, there's not a lot I don't know about the, the, uh, the art. And, and look, there's all kinds of little nooks and crannies. I have not looked in between. If somebody said to me, you know, what's the birthday of so-and-so for, I, I have no idea, you know. But as a as a fundamental rule, and using the Hefty theory as a as a platform to understand um, application practices, and then the, the 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 use of kinetic energy transfer mobility, and then everything is either percussive impact or seizing, and and if it's got to do with seizing, whether it's the hands, the arms, the teeth, the legs, it has to do with the only one function muscle has, which is contraction. And then if you if you you know if you uh, uh, like a nose beside the five ancient machines. Not the six, the five. Five was good enough. Five built the uh, built the pyramids. Uh, you would see that those machines, you know, three categories of lever, pulley, axle, wheel, all that type of stuff, have everything to do with how the human body work and how to manipulate it. Then therein lies uh, the mechanics behind me the mechanics and the prince, the immutable principles that support the mechanics that override all of which there is to know. So it didn't matter what style you were doing. Right. By the time it came to the application of a functional practice, they, it had to fall upon some type of a set of principles, and these were those. So, so I had that already. What I didn't have was the formula through which to impart this information. And that was um, um, thanks to a, a lovely person, by the, her name was Clem West. And she was the uh, she was a retired professor who had I guess you know I guess after her husband passed away and you know uh, she come back and Peter Sherwood who was the director of the college brought her back to help other young understudies coming in who were writing programs for TCM to help them understand how to write programs and when she said to me she's a Jewish lady she goes Patrick Pat. Well, that's just, I, mean, I thought it's very easy. <laughs> and I said, uh, you know, three months I was sitting at the desk. I didn't have one sheet of paper done, you know. And, and she said to me, 
And I said, well, you know, Clem, the fighting arts, they're all so different, you know, and, and I have to find this commonality between them all in order to be able to deliver. I can't deliver a program that's different for her to her to her. Now, I do know that not everybody learns the same thing, excuse me, the same way to accomplish the same outcome. And, and even a deeper understanding of that, that comment is even you will not do the same thing the same way across the spectrum of your life because of the ravages of age uh, and, and the strength and so on to accomplish the same outcome. Now, here he is at uh, 25, mm -hmm. world champion. And here he is at uh, 35, uh, uh, not not the alpha, not, not the same twitch fiber speed that he once had. Well, here he is at 75. Uh, can you help him up the stairs so we can get the leg, you know, I mean, right. and so, so, and she said to me, she goes, but isn't it all the same? I went, no, it's not. It's, it's, you know, it's these things. And she goes, yes, but that's sport or uh, uh, fitness or, you know, I, 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 is this, is it, when the guy strangles you, is it different over there? Uh, does the Taekwondo guys have a different strangle or something? I went, it, it says, it, oh, it's, it went, it went, when, and I went, oh my God. It cannot be as simple as this person who knows right. nothing about it. Right. <laughs> that, that, that really, that's kind of open up a, I, I, I coined the phrase, uh, kick open the floodgates of intelligence and drown them in the depth of my own ignorance. And I went, wow, that was fantastic. Nice. You know? And so she said, Patrick, here's what you need. For every subject, she, we wrote 22 subjects, by the way. Yeah. Uh, you know, anthropology, language, uh, science, principles, yeah. hands-on, therapeutic stuff, uh, instructional skills, pedagogical, whatever. She said, you start with the outcome first. Tell me what's going to happen at the end of that subject. What, 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 does, a, what does that candidate walk away from with the, with the 14 weeks or 28, whatever, however long the semester is? What on that particular thing? Now, now, that's the outcome. Now, give me the bibliography. Now, let's get in and create the lesson plannings. The time will dictate what you need to get up to this outcome. And that and that and use that for all the other I just went I just, and I my mind just went Choo. yes uh, the formula the formula that eighteen unlocks... months later I eighteen months later I, I finished writing a course we got we got the accreditation from the Ministry of Education and boom we were off sailing and uh, we'll, so we'll come back to that later but so we were talking about uh, you know the differences and similarities and so on and so forth so having presided and by the way then they asked me my job was just to write the course i was going to leave and then sherwood said would you consider staying on to deliver the program yourself now i was only delivering i was only going to deliver two subjects myself two subjects uh in uh my, 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 two subjects in four semesters in two years so that became a total of eight uh, individual classes. And they were dealing with hands-on and then the the buburiodo, you know, the, the yep. philosophical, pedagogical, historical, anthropological uh, portion that uh, the theory part, which on top of which the physical part rests. And the other uh, other lectures, like for example, you know, we had uh, in, in, in order to better understand the human body, uh, you know, its unique function and common anatomical weaknesses for understanding the strength and the weaknesses. Uh, I borrowed from existing faculty of medicine, uh, 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 A&P, uh, sorry, AP, uh, mm -hmm. anatomy and physiology mm -hmm. 101. We didn't need 102, 3, 4 because I didn't need to know much about the chemistry or or things that were beyond that, but we did need to know bones and muscle and tissue yeah. and range of motion and things like that. Yeah. So which would accommodate that? And, you know, then field studies, instructional skills, we just took them from other other existing uh, programs to bring it together to make this 22 subject uh, uh, diploma program, two year diploma program. So I will never forget the, uh, you know, and of course in Australia, when kids are ready, you know, they graduate from uh, their, you know, high, the, our equivalent of high school, and then they're deciding on you know, which college or university they're going to go to. There, there would be a period of time where, you know, all same as in the States and Canada, where they'll have a kind of open house for a month or so. 
So, you know, you go to Georgetown or whatever campus it is, you know, to uh, to speak to, you know, the uh, uh, the uh, guidance counselors about, you know, what engineering is about or, you know, what uh, whatever course it is you're in. And they'll tell you, oh, you know, something. so we had one of these weeks. And I remember they asked me to come and, and speak. And uh, I said, yeah, sure, I, I would I would love to, you know. Gee, I remember being in that lecture hall and there was like 200 people come in and the looks on their faces were not the most welcoming to tell you the truth. And, and I could hear the rumbling, you know, what's he know about Taekwondo? And what's he know about Kung Fu? And, you know, what's, he doesn't know anything about Shituru Karate, you know, like who does he think he is to, to, you know, to take accreditation away from us? It was that type of thing, right? And, uh, I had no idea this rivalry was, you know, to at a boiling point, by the way. And, and uh, so somebody says, you know, we start, and I say, uh, hi, uh, you know, my name is Patrick McCarthy. I'll be overseeing the program this year. And all of these hands, and, and I said, folks, may I have your attention just for a moment? Let me give this 40 minute presentation on what the program entails, how it's going to be delivered, what we're going to deliver, and what you're going to learn from this program, and then we'll field questions. Is that okay? And everybody was oh, yeah. So I went on to describe the nature of the program. Because, you know, people, what does he know about? And, I, and what I wanted to say, and by, by the way, I actually did know a lot about Taekwondo, you know, knowing Choi Hong when he first came to got exiled from Korea, and you know, I know a lot about Wing Chun, uh, you know, a yeah. lot about various Kung Fu yes. styles and, and and karate as well. Because I made, I you know, I'm a researcher. That's what my business was to know that, right? And so, but rather than say, "Oh, you're yes, sorry, know so and so," I said, "I think if they know what this program represents, because because teaching is not the same as doing, and doing requires a completely set of different set of skills and." and outcomes and assessment criteria then does doing, you know, I'm willing to bet I'm going to win them over. And as I delivered this program about, you know, you know, injury risk management and uh, pedagogical uh, lesson planning and how, how a child doesn't get the same, uh, uh, doesn't, is, is not a part of the lesson the same way that maybe an alpha or, or a better or a Sigma male or female gets, or, or somebody who's intellectually or physically, uh, it, it has some type of impediment uh, or, you know, how, how a group of nurses are going to get a, everybody gets a different, it's yeah. the same thing because the act of violence never changes, but how you, you can't teach a child the same way you teach an adult and, and, and vice versa, you know? And yeah. uh, so when I finished that, it was like, it was like a standing ovation of it. And I, I was really happy that that went through. So now let me circle back the wagons a bit to talk about differences and similarities. So, so there's a great quote by uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Steve, Stephen Fabian uh, that I that that uh, the quote ju just jumped off the pages of his dissertation when I read it a very long time ago. He said, um, "Now he was talking about Japanese budo. So he, you know where he said, you know, budo is." And I would then include of which karate is an integral part. But it, I'm not going to use uh, Japanese terminology just for the sake of remaining generic here, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the same thing applies to China as it does to Japan and, and, and so on. And in many ways, more than the obvious, it, despite the cultural discriminatory uh, sentiment that remains today because of obvious, you know, Nanjing and uh, Manchukuo and, and Formosa and stuff like that. So, so but in principle. So I'm, I'm thinking to myself, uh, how do I describe this? So I said, okay. Um, and I usually use this my opening lecture, uh, anthropology, uh, cultural anthropology 101. So the fighting arts are a microcosm of the culture from which they come. Uh, a miniature representation of uh, social values and behaviors of uh, and customs in, in that particular culture. You know, Joseph Campbell, uh, as you know, was a, a late, um, um, American anthropologist uh, whose work was the most influential upon me. And uh, Ruth Benedict, uh, there, uh, there's a long list of other cultural anthropologists that I that I quote. I have a great memory for this. And uh, but uh, his words, and out of the out of the sixty or so uh, books that he'd written, 
a hero with a thousand faces was the one that was, you know, my my Bible, so to speak, you know. And and in and in that particular uh, volume, he wrote these words about tradition, by the way. And keep in mind, I don't know if you remember him, Joseph Campbell. He he uh, he brainstormed with uh, uh, George Lucas at uh, at uh, Skywalker Ranch. Uh, discussing a character for a forthcoming uh, SFX movie, uh, and they wanted they were that was of course that would be called Star Wars, and in that uh, he had petitioned uh, uh, Campbell to help him establish the character of a Darth Vader, and that's where the whole samurai look comes from. By the way, I did not know that. Thank you. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a uh, uh, it's a, it's a tiny little point, but you know, it's a, like I say, it's a it's a tiny little fact. But you know, when you know, uh, I love who one of my one of my best students was Jesse Hermanson. I'm sorry, uh, he took his mom's name, Jesse Enkamp. Uh, you know, he Jesse loves to use my quotes from just about everything he's ever written, and there's a one about um, in 1905. Uh, the uh, French mathematician Henri Poincaré wrote something about these facts. We're talking about facts because life is a matter of facts, as is the fighting tradition. Uh, that uh, he said, science like math is built upon facts in the same way that a house is constructed of stone, but that the science is uh, uh, that uh, that uh, a bunch of facts was no more science than a pile of stones was house. Nice. And uh, you see, there's a lot of haphazard learning everywhere in the fighting arts, you know. And uh, sadly, because what you and I might think as a qualified or a fully accredited instructor, and just time out for a minute, uh, we're we're going to talk about Chinese kung fu. You know, I had a conversation with a guy in Taiwan the other day. You know, thank God I got out before the earthquake. And uh, one of his students was speaking, and I said. Uh, this guy doesn't. He goes, oh, my student's been studying for ten years. I said, it's still so he's still a beginner. You know, in karate, you're a begin, you're a master after two years. You know, these days, you know, I mean, it's, and and you know, don't you know, don't get in the way of the you know, don't don't let a story get in the way of the truth type of thing. You know, I just it makes me. Well, it used to make me angry. Now I just laugh. I don't even bother addressing it anymore. Right. With how many experts there are these days. Yeah. But I said, he said, oh, yeah, because old school, as you know, in 10 years, you, you're just, you're still a child, like you're still a beginner, 20 years, maybe. So, and when I speak to folks here in Okinawa about, you know, you know, guys like, for example, which come boom and folks who went off to China, by the way, and I think, so, you know, I was there for three years, well, three years, you wouldn't even got the first form, you know, I mean, right. and, or you would have only got the first form, you know, right. no applications at all, right. you know, right. Right, just, just foundation building type of thing, you know. True. But see that nobody wants to hear about those types of stuff because today we are in an extremely self-serving uh, culture where uh, we need everything uh, today, right now, and uh, you know, and as long as a guy from the MIA can beat your face, you know, the BJJ guy or catch wrestler can choke you unconscious, the years that you've spent on this are completely ridiculous, and nobody's nobody's concerned with the art or the. Uh, uh, the, the lifestyle or the fitness or the, you know, the, it's just, can I beat the living right. shit out of that? That's all, all that matters, you know, and right. uh, and it's sad that we've gone that far. But that, anyway, so that's for the, another part of the conversation. So being that the art uh, is as much a part of the culture as the culture is part of the art, uh, I, I, I don't, would you remember, would you remember Obsidian Storm? <laughs> would you remember this, this this house is like a it's like a I love it. You see them curiosity things. You I remember this it. work by the way? Oh, of course, I have that on my shelf. Yes, had have had it. Yeah, for many so years. so. Uh, and by the way, this this book never turned out to be the way I wanted it. That's a long story uh, about. There was supposed to be more than a hundred photographs in here, but thanks to to Dadashi Yamashita, they never really appeared. Now, oh, sorry to hear. That's that. for another story, another <laughs> time. By the way, right? and. Uh, but a little whiz, things, little little scotch for that one, or or a lot. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so there was there was a there was a quote uh, there was a passage I wrote in this book of, of, about you know that important people should not be forgotten if only to help better understand the latent uh, potential in ourselves, 
And, uh, you know, at one time when I was, uh, uh, Richard Kim, by the way, was the first one to put me on the pathway of studying the uh, the Kotawaza, you know, the, sorry, Kotawaza, the Proverbs, uh, Onko Chishin and Buguri Odo, along with dozens of other ones. But, you know, to study in the past would be the best way to understand the present with regards to what forces affected their growth and direction to make them what they are today. We'll show you what behavior, as opposed to words, describe for the potential in the future. And then, of course, the boom, the odo, the, the ability to balance uh, the theoretical, the philosophical, and the scholarly with the, uh, the practical, you know, the brawn and the brain together type of thing. And this would open up a passageway for me, uh, which I'm still, I suppose, in many ways, I'm still on, you know. And, but to, to, to have those, both of those pathways would help bring so much more meaning so that when I hear something like, ah, the, he couldn't fight his way out of a wet paper bag, well, you know, that might have worked back in the day where you, you know, uh, in the class structure where you, you know, if a samurai couldn't use a sword, there's probably not much value of having mm -hmm. it, you know. And, but that doesn't mean it's thrown away or something, right? And today, look at today, folks, uh, like-minded people, embrace uh, the fighting traditions for all kinds of reasons, you know. Right. And and and, and not all of them are for functional <clears throat> um, right. efficacy in, in self-defense. And, and, you know, and how many of my friends who are in the military, law enforcement, correctional uh, officers and understand that implicitly you know self-defense get a gun i mean you know that that's truly the truly and you know it's funny when i when i talk to guys you know and i've worked all over the world you know in, in military and military and middle east uh, israel places like that where where these that's that's what these guys do for a living and this idea of you know joint life pressure point take down strangulation throw grappling groundwork all of the functional applications that go ahead and hand with the understanding our kunse or tauru or xing chuan forms kata our, you know, our template-based uh, 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 application concepts against quantifiable acts of physical violence. You know, right. these guys, you know, they're on, they're on an op and and they're doing something, and there's a and there's a target that gets in the way. They eliminate the target, and they don't eliminate them with a spinning heel kick. You know, they right. eliminate them with a with a nine millimeter parabellum at, at mm -hmm. usually close range. So. This need for, and you know, it's the mentality of the the the, the warrior like uh, athletes, you know, in the cage who contrast, uh, you know, this uh, this uh, and and taking nothing away from them, by the way. I mean, it's just I mean, you know, that I fought in the cage as well, I, and 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 I'm going to tell you that the type of training and, and mentality and behavior that under uh, underscores. Uh, preparatory process to go and do that and my in my days it was 10 minute rounds by the way not five and, and in many cases especially when we were with Saima Satoru from Shuto there wasn't any rules at all you know and uh and at least when we went with um uh, uh the the original breakaway to shoot boxing with a uh, Caesar Takeshi at least we had rules and uh we were boxing gloves but the problem is you try to grapple and box or clinch right. And right. grapple or ground fight with boxing gloves are ridiculous, yeah. you know. Yeah. And that's why we all kind of then sided over. And that was that was the big split area. Then came K1, then came Pancrats, then came uh rings with my Daikira, and then of course my group UWFI with uh Hakara Nobuhiko, you know. And and our our ironically Japanese based group, our uh, our mentors of that era would be guys like Carl Koch, uh Billy Robinson, Lou Thez, uh, Gene LaBelle, you know, yeah, uh, and catch, we were we, we we embraced catch wrestling, you know, yeah, and it's funny because I look back now, and I'm gonna later when we when I talk about kata, the theory theory behind kata, uh, or, or forms, I'll, I'll I'll talk to you about that night, never forget it, in the stable rest there in the dojo, the mogu, and me having another one of these epiphanies, watching the guys in the ring, just remind me to come back. That is such remarkable thing anyway we're talking culture cultural differences and similarities so uh so the point is there's like so many of these so many of these i want to say differences so there's 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 historical origins that are different there's philosophical principles that are different there are posturing and techniques 
positioning and, and technical uh, technical techniques that are different. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there are training methodologies to accomplish these outcomes that are differences. And then of course there are there are what we call uh, cultural differences. And you know, we talk uh, a lot about you know uh, people and, and and who did what and so on. So I you know, just want I was gonna give you a time out to I wanna I want to do this because I want this to be on record for for down the road sometime for other people to come back to study this. So so here's the thing. Um, when Richard Kim gave me the the the, the keys to the door the, to the kingdom, um, I was so deeply passionate and captured by the essence of historical study. I had to know who everybody was, and not just who everybody was, but their dates of birth, their dates of death, where they lived, when they lived, how they lived, who they trained with, uh, who else they came into contact with, how did what they brought together uh, uh, sh get shaped into something that would become uniquely their own, or was it generically something else? And so, you know, you and I know, because we know the Chinese, we know that that, and they know China, of course, they have a history that dates back to, you know, day one. You know, it's not 5,000 years old, it's not Chinese, right? And they try to make this linear, a linear uh, 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 genealogical lineage down from Yu Fei all the way down to Guan Gong and right to Wang Fei Hong and then finally to us, you know. And, uh, and you know, we we know yeah. it's myth and logic. Right. We, you know, yes. the principles of the story is what's important. Right. And so, and so I, I don't think there's any original. In fact, to tell you, I'm not even sure that the word original even means anything. Because, you know, when we sum up the word uh, tradition, because tradition seems to be the mechanism through which the original is, is passed on throughout the ages. But it's like the Chinese whispers joke, you know, la, la, la. by the time it gets to the 20th guy, the 10th guy, it's not the same as it was in the beginning. Right. And, you know, we can actually do this in a physical format. In five minutes at a seminar, just teach a guy, hey, will you do this? And by the time it's completely different. So the fact exactly. that it was 100 years or 200 years or 500 years or something, you know, belies the whole issue here. So, so at one point or another, after I learned who all the guys were, their dates of birth and death, and who they trained with, and how whatever it was that they shaped into a practice, whether it be a a, a uniquely specialized practice or a generic practice. Um, how it subsequently was passed on or how it influenced uh, the hands into which that generation would then be responsible for influencing people within their field of influence. Mm -hmm. I got to a point after a while, once I, once I understood what tradition truly represented, i.e. Um, um, the constant and never ending search for improvement. You know, the cats, C A N I, the cat I, again, uh, that's, right. you know. Right. Uh, really, really pointing to the difference between a dead tradition and a living tradition. Well, you know, don't don't say that out too loud because, uh, you know, those are fighting words uh, for a lot of people. <laughs> Teacher, that is the way. And I'm Miyagi. You know, I mean, I think right. if Miyagi chose to saw what was happening today, he'd probably roll over his grave, you know, to tell you the truth. Yeah. And, and so on for the rest of them. So, Anyway, going back to the issue here, so uh, after a while, when I started targeting and focusing in on this culture, the transition of a person's life with regards to practice and age and the ramifications of age and, and strength, and, and the fact that the acts of physical violence, which, which are quantifiable, by the way, you know, uh, would never change, it doesn't matter, matter if it was 500 years ago in a Shaolin temple or, or out back right now. One against one, and I, I'm not talking about hey, hey, let's come on, buddy. Let's no, no, no. I'm talking about self defense. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, at the ATM, like with card, I get jumped from behind. Right. I don't have time to turn around and say, hey, or or you want to fight? You know, right. that's all ego related distractions. So I'm talking actual self defense, mm -hmm. and I'm not even talking guns and knives and melee. And, uh, you're going to mm -hmm. lose. You're going to get shot and killed and stabbed. That's you know. I'm talking about. Stuff that you can't handle, you know. Nobody ever wants to talk about the other stuff because you're going to lose or die or get maimed or something like that. It's and, all ugly. You know, well, if I'm thinking green, 
put the tip of the tongue of my roof of my bowl, put the, uh, a lux mug in, in the you know, gallbladder 27 years. Unless you also buy with the $250 seminar the, <laughs> the antidote. Right. Anyway, let's not go down that path. <laughs> let's not go down that path. And so, so because of these this whole cultural issue and be, because of, you know, when you start with Campbell's, you know, Campbell's quote, you know, every generation produce, about tradition, every generation produces um, innovative people who, in an effort to keep uh, their traditions a living experience uh, for the community that they serve, find reasons with which to reinterpret the common principles upon which it rests. And despite the lip service paid to uh, this style is better than that style, that's propaganda. Yeah, my, my, my restaurant is better than yours. Eat here, spend your money here, not over there. Type of thing. You know, inalienable. It, it's an inalienable. Right? Of course, everybody has the right to do that. It doesn't, have, it doesn't mean everybody's going to swallow it or believe it, by the way. But that's, right. that's the other thing. And so you see that tradition is about that. It is continually seeking out what the pioneers sought in the first place. And in, in in order to keep your practices, you know, what's Chimano said, in order to keep the reservoir moving so it doesn't become stagnant. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, I, I I I it wasn't that I stopped looking for Sakagawa's real date of birth or or did Matsumura really fly like a crane? You know, I mean, it, it wasn't that I gave up on any of that. And I'm still always fascinated to listen to, to all the new guys making a new discovery and a secret art uh, reveal here is a, and I, I am the gateway through which you can learn the old secret art that was never revealed yeah. in Okinawa, but me, I got it, you know, I'm, right. I'm from Europe or the States and I can teach it to you. Right. Only 39.95, you know. Right. I, so I said, enough of that. I think historically I got the facts. Uh, I think uh, technically uh, from a mechanical and a scientific point, I understand how art and science uh, comes together to uh, create this transformative magic, if you will, or let's just simply call it a pathway uh, upon which to uh, head forward uh, to improve your not just your physical skill, but your uh, your uh, uh, your intellectual understanding of what it is that brings us all together. And whether or not you ever achieve the outcome. Uh, knowing that the practice is worth uh, everything. It is, you know. Oh, <laughs> I was uh, talking to my wife last night about uh, translations, you know. Oh. My, I don't know if you saw my post the other day. I put a post up about this new uh, thing. And I was talking to a, a colleague here, Steve Jarvis, who we were talking about, uh, you know, uh, Lost in Translation. Not the movie with right. Scarlet. Right, and, right, right. You know, but uh, just <laughs> the idea of trying to, you know, we're talking about differences in culture and so on. <laughs> and... Uh, and I said to her, I said, yeah, you know, um, often when you try to translate something from one culture to a, you know, a, 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 an answer like yes or no is really easy, you know, but when you're trying to um, explain a cultural phenomenon to someone else, uh, we I was remembering, you know, I used to have my dojo up in Fujisawa on the mainland in Kanagawa, and, and um, I had this, uh, we're very close to a naval, an American naval base up there. I used to get some American students come and train with me. And of course, most of my students were all local Japanese, right? Anyway, this one guy off the Blue Ridge was, uh, you know, he was kind of fancy on this girl I had in my dojo. And, and you know, I was going to act as the go-between, you know, my wife and I. I put a barbecue at my house and invite them over. And wow. some other people. And, and uh, you know, she she uh, was a university student, but she practically cut up there with me and yeah. And she'd also practice, uh, you know, Ikebana and, and uh, Shoto, mm -hmm. flower arrangement, stuff like yeah. that, and uh, tea ceremony. And, and uh, so he said, they say, Sensei McCarthy, can you ask her, you know, why why does she like practice like taking two hours to pour a cup of tea? You know, like, well, I don't get that. And so I asked her, I said, you know, I said, oh, I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a, I'm a smarter this app. Oh, sorry, man. he's got a question. and and what's that? She this, and she says in Japanese, she was not a great English speaker, he's not a Japanese speaker. Right. So I said, uh, I said, she said she does flower arrangement and tea ceremony for the same reason she does uh karate, which is 
I was assuming for the same reason you knew karate. And he goes, for self-defense? And I and she <laughs> laughed. She goes, <laughs> and I said, he said, why is she laughing? And I said, I said, that's not why she's studying karate at Ikebana. She said, she's studying it to learn more about herself. And he, I swear to God, it was like, he just went, <laughs> If I ever saw the look of love that was in a guy's face, it was like, you know, but see that, so that was a totally alien thing for him, you know. Sure, yeah. But you're talking about cultural differences. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we, we we live in this very functionally direct uh, culture, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she's, the Japanese yeah. is not a functionally direct yeah. culture. Yeah, and, and so, anyway, so. So, I, Hanshi, if I could just throw in just a little, uh, uh, an epiphany that I had. I was in Japan with a, with, I was in Okinawa with a friend of mine. I saw somebody wearing a, a mask. This was maybe eight or so years ago, pre-COVID, they were wearing a mask. I said, oh, is there like a, a case of like a bird flu or something going around or something? And my friend said to me, my friend who is an American who has spent some time living in Japan, he said, Russ, just remember, this is not the States. That person is not sick. That person is not worried about getting sick. That person is feeling sick and not wanting to give it to other people as they go through their day it's a very different paradigm. You have to flip it around on your head. And, I, and it really stuck with me as a good example of a, a very difference between you know Japanese and American culture. Spot on, my friend. That's exactly it. And, and that whole um, concern for other people is uh, uh, I'm coming home. For, it's it's uh, you know uh, mid 80s. I'm uh, coming home from the train station. And I um, and I bump into a, a, I bump, a guy bumps into me on the street. That was a fairly decent bump, you know. I don't, I don't think it was on purpose in, in retrospect, but it was pretty 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 hard bump. And I, she's like, turn around, you know. I turn around and looked at him like this, and he looked at me, and uh, right away, you know, I'm 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 you know I'm thinking this is going to be an aggressive issue, and uh, he you know he looks at me and goes ah. Oh, Oh, and I went, okay, he probably wants to fight or something. Later, I would come to know that that is a very profound way of apologizing. You know, oh. and so we started all arguing over who was more sorry, you know. And uh, right, right. you know because they're very uh, they're bark men like to bark you know yeah, yeah. and uh, you know we interpret barking as a uh, aggressive form uh, and uh, <laughs> that 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 and another little issue about you know I'm you know like I'm a Canadian you know we grew up with these silly values of you know opening doors for people and and. Uh, Paying our respects to elderly people and you know take, giving your chair to a, a lady or something like that. And I was on a train. It's a man's world in Japan. You know, mm -hmm. I'm on a train coming down from Tokyo to Fujisawa. It, the train is, you know, they, they hire people to shove it in there. And oh, this yeah. old lady comes on the train, uh, and uh, no, no boy, and no boys would stand up. And she had a pack on, and and I said, I'm going to give her my seat. But I knew if I got up to give. Her, my, if I would only give my those kids would jump in my seat and I would have to you know pull one of them out of there because they wouldn't you know right. form an introduction based on the abstract about this social thing for kids they wouldn't get it right right so I, I lift up my ass up off the seat I put my hand down on the empty spot where my ass was and I looked at the guy and I went I said something don't touch your seat and I waved over to the woman and I said and I said with my masterful Japanese I went ah, ah, dozo <laughs> and in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm saying, please come over here <clears throat> and sit here. That's what that's in my mind. That's what I'm saying. But she looks at me, she goes, Oh my god, she darts away. And I go, <laughs> the kids are laughing at me. Uh, the uh, the one guy leaned against the door is going. Oh, what you know, did I, I say? To my wife, I said, I, I recite the story and I go, what did I do wrong? And she goes, you mixed up the word sa, I'm oh, sorry, su, the, su means to say, you, 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 you uh, mix up the word su for sa. So, dozo, o, 
su or sa. Dozo o suari kurasai. So I mix up just one word. Yeah. Su means to sit and sa means to touch. Oh. Come on over here and have a touch of this. You know? <laughs> anyway. So, yeah. Fun's in tra fun in travel. Yes. Oh, and lost in translation as well, by the way. So, <laughs> so yeah, look. Uh, so just once again about about the differences so you've got all of these things you have cultural you have language you have uh, behavior customs rituals uh origins uh, uh food uh you know, a lot of these things are different but 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 and we're talking we're going to talk about chinese but in order for us to actually in my opinion sorry um and everything i tell you is in my opinion by the way i'm, I'm, I'm not unless i cite uh, let me just jump back. From where I want to say one thing. Uh, I was talking about my lectures 101 and, and uh, 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 cultural anthropology. My, sorry, my I did martial art technique and I did martial art foundation. So the physical techniques, one thing with, uh, and the martial art foundation dealt with this, this cultural anthropology, language, history, uh, uh, philosophy, uh, pedagogical aspect. Uh, all, these these things all together in, in the let's say. And so it was it was my study of these people that helped me shape my understanding of what I imparted. And just one more thing, by the way, I told you that I was a high school dropout and uh, a high school dropout. And it wasn't it, it was just it was a matter of it was a matter of circumstances or just from family and an alcoholic father and, and uh, you know, not things not being right at home. And for and, you know, I came from a. You know, my father came from a very large family of, you know, 13 people, and he was a uh, last guy born, and his, and it was, they, they, I think they call him a, uh, there's a term for it, a change of life babies is what he was. He was born in, like, 1930, and, and his next older brother was born in 1915, so it was like, he was brought up by his, and, and during his era, it was like, you know, when you were 12 or 13, it was, get out, get a job, you know, and not, now here I am at 16, already, and I'm not out, <laughs> And having a job and my father right. didn't think that was good so right you know the, the point being is you know you get out early you start uh um learning about life in general and uh if i needed to learn something about what i was doing i just went and learned that so i didn't have a high school certificate now i've been hired by a college to write a program because i had become an expert in that particular field and th those guys who i don't tell them uh the guy who hired me at the time was the uh, he was the treasurer for the World Karate Federation uh, who had worked. So he worked with Antonio Espinosa in Madrid, Spain, who was the president of the World Karate Federation. But he also happened to be the president of the Australian Karate Federation at the same time. And he had come and listened to me lecture in Japan when, uh, when I was uh, attending the Marshall University. Every March, we'd have what we call a a, uh, uh, a martial art Budo symposium uh, seminars where all foreign people came together to study everything that we're talking about, not just punching and kicking, but all of the major martial arts uh, of Japan, the Budo, the Budo of Japan, were being imparted by the leading authorities there. And uh, and I and I had I had already come. I'd been a part of Don Dreger's group back in the seventies, and you know when he died, some of his inner circle students. Had created a new group uh, called JMAS, Japan Martial Arts Society. You know, a uh, Phil Relnick, uh, Liam Healy, uh, Mike Scoss, uh, Phil Relnick, uh, Hunter Armstrong. These guys, you know, mm -hmm. and and I'd become a part of that. And 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 in the years of the early years that I come to Japan, um, uh, Phil Relnick asked me if I would be if I would be the admin for the group, and I wasn't I wasn't interested in becoming the admin of the group because not because I wasn't interested in what it represented, it was uh, most of those guys were uh, uh, Koru stylists, you know, uh, mm -hmm. they were doing uh, Jodo and yep. and Kendo and uh, Naginata and uh, and uh, uh, Aikido and stuff like that. And I, I, was a, I was a karate person, you know, I was a, a percussive impact guy. And, and so I oh, turned down the position, but it opened up the door for those of us who were in the karate group or part of that to shape that's how the International Root Karate Research Society got uh, founded, by the way, in 1988. And anyway, I jumped. Back. So go back to the college for a minute now. So these guys had heard me speak uh, in a very informal sense at the symposium, at the symposium, 
and they were very impressed with it. And that's how I got invited to Australia to give a, a lecture and uh, seminars uh, for them to evaluate who I was. They didn't tell me when I first came why they were bringing me. I would only learn that at the end, the last couple of days of my first visit. And and so that's for another conversation. So back to the college and uh, and uh, the uh, the head of the faculty says to me, oh, uh, Dr. McCarthy, uh, you know, we'll need your, uh, we'll need your uh, credentials, by the way, for uh, now, right. now that the course has uh, been yeah, accepted yeah. Right. and, uh, and, you know, uh, we're, we're, now we're going to do advertisement and, you know, they, they put me in a karate gi with a, with a, uh, you know, a PhD uh, graduation hat and a, and a cloak and, <clears throat> and, a, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and a diploma for photo, it was a professional photographic you know, yeah. session to advertise for the first uh, and by the way, our students came from all over the world, by the way, you know, uh, to advertise worldwide for this martial art uh, diploma program. And and Clem says, and where, where did you read for your PhD, Patrick? And I was like, oh, she will need all of that information. You know, oh, God, I'm in trouble now. I, uh -oh. I, I got to find out I'm, I'm not who I say I am, you know. And I was very, very insecure about that. So I reached out to a colleague of mine. Uh, in Israel, <clears throat> who was a, uh, his background is in pedagogical, he had a PhD in pedagogical prison, and he had been <clears throat> a, a lecturer at the Wingate Institute for 17 years, which is a big institute through which using the physical fitness and uh, other martial arts, Karamagawa would be an impart. His name was uh, Dr. Ronnie Pluger. Oh, yes. And I, I'd written to Roni, and I said, Roni, who I knew through my old childhood friend, uh, uh, Chuck Merriman, by the way, you know. And I said, uh, gee, I'm kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, could you help me? And he said, what? and I told him. And he goes, oh, you're not a PhD either? I'm like, why does everybody keep thinking about PhD? He goes, he goes, he says, well, look at this. With, with the amount of work you've done, <laughs> there's, 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 there's universities and colleges all over the world who will happily uh, give you PhD or or, they would. or even just just go go to the certificate mill and get an honorary one if you want. I mean, they're, well, they're you've written so much that could be used as a dissertation already. <laughs> so he said to me, he said, "Well, look at he said if you, he said I'm happy to help you." And he said, and he said, and and by the way, I already was uh, assisting him in his program as uh, I don't mean to say I was a chairman, but I was on the chair uh, of his group, the uh, International Buddhist University. And and my, my and my part and parcel was to help with books with the history of the Freudian arts and pedagogical part. And so he said, "Well, here's what I'll need from you." He said, "Would you please take your, you know, your classical kata, the the, the stuff that you've written, the translations you've done?" And at that time, I had done, I had done, uh, sorry, I had done uh, before. Oh, before oh, oh. Wait till you turn around. Oh, yeah. Ah! <laughs> yeah, good. So, so I had done that. That I think that issue was number three. That was number three. Uh, that that was number two. I do um, not have number two. I, yeah. That's number one, and this is this, this is number four, right? Wow. Yes. And then, yes. And then there's been half a dozen more after that. Yes. Thing. Yes. But he said, "Do me a favor." He said, "Send send all of those to me, and just uh, put it all together into a word word for uh, uh, a program." send it to me and uh, I'll take care of the rest. And so, uh, and there was a, so the process between the course getting accredited and the first semester starting, it was, it was around 10 months. It was around that period of time. And, and I'd done a lot of traveling in between. And he said, he said, okay, I want you to get on an airplane, come to Israel. <clears throat> and I went, okay. And of course I would teach some seminars while I was yeah, here. Yeah. So. But he said, we went to the college and all of them, the whole faculty was there. And, and, and it wasn't just me, it was, it was a presentation for everybody else. And he conferred upon me this uh, PhD and, and, uh, and I went, oh gosh. That's <laughs> awesome. Very look, cool. I showed my mom. <laughs> I, look, and I would, I would never go and advertise that type of thing because for me, it was a personal thing. And it was, and it was a favor that a colleague did for me. But, but he said, and he said, look at, he said, so when I got back, I sat down with Clem and I said, you know, Clem, I, I have to talk to you about this whole PhD thing. She goes, what? I said, I said, well, first of all, here's my certificate. And she looked at it. She goes, oh, oh, I didn't realize you, you just got your PhD. And I went, yeah, kind of. Yeah. 
And I explained the story, and she said, she said to me, she goes, she goes, look, you should have told me that up front. I would have saved you a lot of work. She said, ah. she said, it doesn't really matter if you were, you never went to school at all. She said, there's, we don't measure intelligence with pieces of paper, by the way. And and, and wow. there's lots of people teaching in, in the course in college and, and, and in academia, in tertiary level academia, that, that, that don't have that. But sure. one thing that you will need is you will need uh, an accreditation that tells the faculty of education and the Ministry of Education that you know how to deliver your program. Mm. And so there, there was this there was a certificate for in a workplace uh, training for commercial colleges <clears throat> that anybody had. It didn't matter what degree you had or that you didn't have, that you needed this. So I had to go to the University of Queensland and do this course, which was actually perfect because it was only six months long. And I would have four months later to make up for that. And it turned out to actually be really quite a quite a uh, quite an educational uh, uh, pathway for me because uh, part of being a lecturer or, or teacher or professor uh, or an assistant professor at, a, at the college level, commercial college, is that <clears throat> if you're there teaching, say, three classes a day, and in between one of your classes, you got a two three hour break, and there's another lecturer who's maybe sick or can't make the class, they'll also still sometimes come to the faculty and say. Uh, you know, faculty of health sciences, we need you over at room uh, 202 uh, to do to, and, and you go, yeah, sure. And this training program allowed you to understand this. We would go to the faculty and we would and, and look at look at his module descriptor. And let's say, let's just hypothetically say it was a, a, a semester two, uh, a week four, uh, uh, lesson four. So, you know, you go to his module descriptor, you'd look that up and you'd pull out the lesson plan. You'd read the lesson plan, you'd see what the, the lesson targets were, what the assessment criteria, what the bibliography was, or what the outcomes were, what the bibliography. So you would just go and say, hi guys, I'm so-and-so filling in for Professor So today. Uh, the lesson today is on whatever it was. Uh, please pick up this book, turn to page uh, 402. We'll start with so and so, and and that's how that's how the class would go, and that would become extremely valuable for me uh, down the road, and and after having delivered uh, the program for say the first two years, two year two year diploma by the way, right? I remember sitting back and thinking to myself, my God, I've learned more about the fighting arts in these two years that I ever have in the last 30 or 40 years leading up to it. Now, without that previous prerequisite, the other part probably wouldn't have been sure. to me. Yeah. So I'm just not saying that that was everything. Yeah. But talk about the ability of tying loose ends together. Yeah. It gave you a new set of lenses to look at all your prior experiences. That transparency I got. So, okay, now we come back to the cultural differences. And one of the reasons why I want to focus so much on Japan right now at this part of the interview uh, is because a lot of what happened to China, a lot of what happened to the way Chinese fighting arts would be embraced and imparted has everything to do with has a very, very large part to do with uh, Japanese occupation and the the force of Japanese power uh, in uh, China. Uh, so let me back up to you now, and I'll make two points. And these are points that are very, very rarely ever talked about. So, And it's part of another legend of the Fist Volume 2 of them. When, when we talk about what I'm, <laughs> I've got so much stuff on the go right now, you know, I just hope I get around to getting it all done. But <clears throat> so everybody talks about, you know, kata and forms and routines and, you know, the secret and don't change anything and all that type of stuff. And, you know, I really have so little understanding of, you know, such a thing. And um, so um, from about, uh, and, you know, why why it is that we do the things the way we do today. It also did this and fully goes that never change. And, and, you know, so in my lectures, uh, I would start off in the anthropology part of the start like this. Uh, um, 
you know, the I, the Japanese part, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Budo has embraced in Japan, uh, of which karate is an integral part, is a, a microcosm of the culture from which it comes, a miniature representation of all of these behavior, customs, rituals, so on. And so by learning more about the culture, so too do you learn more about the art and vice versa, of course, right? So then it pays some dividends to understand something about the culture, right? And so in, in doing so, the more you learn about the culture, the more you learn about the art, the more you learn about yourself invariably, right? And so we see that <clears throat> um, modern Japanese culture <clears throat> is based upon largely a millennium of male-dominated, uh, homogeneous, um, uh, safely, say, uh, 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 extremely discriminatory, discriminatory uh, policies in a culture, in, in, in a culture of conformity. And the, and the mechanism used uh, in that culture to ensure that it rarely ever changes uh, is this uh, uh, is is based upon Confucian uh, mentality, and the first tenet of Confucianism is, is filial piety mm -hmm. uh, or ancestor worship, and and of course how that translates into this mechanism, uh, this senpai kohai, the uh, this uh, sorry, this adoration of your seniors, and uh, and through the uh, imitative behavior and trickle down effect, uh, it is perpetuated in the in the junior imitating the senior ways. Uh, through the no questioning of authority, mm -hmm. and a little a little side uh, 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 proverb that is used with this is is called a uh, deru kui wa utareru or deru kugi wa utareru. Kugi means nail, and kui means peg, and it, it's this little about about balking or fighting against the the status quo. You know, uh, a protruding nail ultimately gets pounded down, and if it doesn't stay pounded down, it gets plucked out. Or so metaphorically speaking, in this case, if you're one who fights the system and you don't stay pushed down, or you don't conform, you get the ostracized, pushed out. Right. And so understanding this, and people would say, "Oh, you're, you know, you're, 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 uh, you're bagging the Japanese culture." I'm not bagging the Japanese culture. There's a difference between factual evidence. And uh, and uh, opinion, you know, and that's where I then I started. I mean, people would all McCarthy's, uh, and, you know, racist or against the. I said no. I'm quoting guys like Joseph Campbell, uh, 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 Edwin Reichauer, the former ambassador to Japan, uh, Ruth Benedict, Kirstanton, uh, and so. On. And I, I go on and list these Carl von Wolver and a whole list mm -hmm. of twenty cultural anthropologists who said the same words, mm -hmm. and I just merely wrapped it together and and and. Uh, and describe the principle of what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. So understanding this part about Japanese culture and its profound uh, um, focus on nationalism, and rightfully so, after a period of time where Japan was dragged out from the uh, from the depths of the dark ages of feudalism uh, into what would be about 50 years of becoming one of the most powerful nations on mm -hmm. earth. Mm -hmm. um, it pays dividends to understand this transitory position and how the force during a period of radical military escalation had paved the way for this mindset and, and the distortion of uh, spiritual uh, beliefs, uh, you know, which were culminated in Shintoism based upon mm -hmm. Buddhism and Confucianism, uh, Taoism, uh, and, and then used by the uh, Department of War and, and uh, folks like the uh, Propaganda used for by the Batoko Kai, uh, Batokai, uh, to shape. Uh, uh, remember, uh, uh, no class structure after the major, in the major restoration. And you saw the movie uh, Tom Cruise, uh, which is just a movie, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but you you understand the time period in which it sums this up. Mm -hmm. This Bakamatsu period, this 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 trans uh, transitory period where you know uh, uh, Cruise had a few drinks and he he. Opens his body with a a, a guy who'd been a peasant, now is a soldier through conscription and say shoot me and mm -hmm. you know the guy couldn't hit the broadside of a barn and and you know this opens up the door for such a wonderful uh, period of transition you know Erwin uh, 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 von Baylitz uh, anyway 
we'll say the German part, which is a very important part, by the way, for the Karate people, uh, for just a little bit later chronologically down the line here. 